Welcome to Transform, Ignite, Disrupt, bringing you interviews and insights covering proven practical strategies to unlock your company's innovation potential. Here's your host, Stephen L. Blue. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Transform, Ignite, and Disrupt. I'm excited to have you here today just because, well, I'm just always excited to talk about how to transform a company, disrupt the marketplace and ignite innovation. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. But first, I promised you that every now and again, I would take a side detour for something dumb in the news, some leadership dummy doing some dumb leadership thing. And, and United Airlines has once again handed me a perfect example. Maybe you saw this in the news not long ago, but some poor woman was getting ready to get on an airplane and uh, on United, and she saw them whisking some big shot into the plane before anybody else got on. Now, don't you just hate that? You're sitting there, and maybe you bought a first-class seat. Maybe you've done a lot of things, and, and it's like, who is this person? Why do they get special privileges? Well, this was a congressperson who apparently grabbed this dear woman's seat and uh, and bumped her off the plane somehow. So when the woman got ready to get on the plane, the, uh, the gate agent said, no, you don't have a ticket. Not only don't you have the first class seat that you paid for, but you don't have a ticket at all. I mean, that's just, and it took United like a week to apologize to the woman, and then they gave her a $500 voucher. Now, my guess is that first class seat cost her a lot more than $500, and why in the hell didn't they give her the full value of the first class seat and another seat besides. Well, I'll tell you why. As I've told you this before, United Airlines doesn't have policy problems. They've got culture problems. They have a toxic culture where they treat people like cattle and it isn't customer service. It isn't, you know, well, the best in class. What it is, is put the cattle in, take the cattle out. Cattle don't care. Cattle can't feel. Cattle can't do anything. And it's a just a typical example of a toxic culture gone wild. And United Airlines, thank you, United Airlines, for handing me yet another example of dumb leadership practices practices performed by dumb leaders. So anyway, that's sort of today's dumb leader uh, in a minute. Now, what I want to talk about is, first of all, in a previous episode, we talked about Jeff Tuomi and uh, his company, that uh, uh, core ID services that uh, disrupted the entire entire um, uh, industry that protects identity, identity theft industry. And and the point I want to make that I should have made when we did the episode was, you know, Jeff found the perfect storm and he found the perfect uh, intersection between uh, a, a an industry that needed disrupting. And that, and the uh, uh, identity theft industry was one for sure. And at a time when it needed disrupting the most, at a time when the industry needed to be uh, reformed and needy, w- and the industry was on on, uh, on an apex of of uh, interest. And certainly, Jeff found that intersection at the time when all of a sudden, you know, Experian and um, the other uh, the other uh, credit reporting agencies were getting hacked. Uh, all, uh, uh, all the, uh, big Yahoo was getting hacked. All the companies that collect people's data were getting hacked. And so that was a time when the, when the industry needed to be disrupted the most and he found a way to disrupt it. And that's what I would encourage you to do. Look for industries that, that are ripe for disrupting and are at the apex of the, of the consumer need at the point in time when, uh, the consumers need the disruption the most. That's what Jeff did. He calls it luck. I don't think so. I don't call it that. And the, so, so uh, segue into today's episode, though, uh, we're going to take you back to, as you know, I do League of Extraordinary CEO interviews uh, about once a month in the American City Business Journals. Uh, and I uh, always uh, interview some cool CEO who's done something really cool. And the point I want to make is intro to uh, Mike Rotondo, who is my next guest, who uh, uh, formed Tropical Smoothies, is you don't have to, you know, you don't have to uh, invent the next uh, uh, rocket into space. You don't have to invent the next thing that no one's ever heard of it, no one's ever thought of. In fact, you don't want to because those kind of inventions are very expensive because the, you have to create the market. The market doesn't yet exist. Mike Rotundo formed um, Tropical Smoothies, and it's like he disrupted the tropical smoothie industry. I mean, come on. Come on, who'd have thunk of that? I mean, that, that's a, just a great example of an industry that's already in place, a market that's already in place, and he just moved in and disrupted it. Now, as you listen to the interview, I want you to pick up on a couple of points. The first one is, 
Uh, it's basically franchise play. And typically, you know, franchisees have to come to like annual conferences and they hate it. Well, I, I shouldn't say they don't hate. A friend of mine used to own a McDonald's franchise and they loved when they brought them all to Las Vegas or brought them all to Miami or brought them someplace, you know, uh, warm in the wintertime. And they all basically sat around and, you know, and played golf and had nice dinners with their wives and, and McDonald's paid for it. Okay. So it was just, it was a waste of time. It was a waste of money, but people like to do it. But in the tropical smoothie case, most of the franchisee, franchisees wouldn't even come to the annual convention. And I don't blame them because they had to spend their own money and they had to spend their own time. And when they're doing that, they're not running their businesses. What, what Mike did is he said, tell you what, guys, he put a bullet in it right away. His first statement, which is a big statement to the shareholders and the franchisees, was from now on, we're going to be working for you, not the other way around. So he put a bullet in the annual uh, franchisee conference and ended it. And what he did is, is he got a bus or something, and he went on a road show, and he said, I'm going to come around and see every single one of you, and I'm going to find out what it is I can do to help you, and I'm going to make you more successful, and I'm, it's not going to be the other way around. So I, it was just, it's just a fantastic play, and, and, it's a, and it's a, you know, just a plain old industry that's that's already you know saturated by a bunch of players and there's nothing rocket science here about the industry but there is something rocket science about the way mike rotundo approached the business and how he how he totally disrupted it uh, on its end and the, the growth that he had was unbelievable and phenomenal so listen to this i think you're really going to enjoy it and i'll look forward to seeing you in the next podcast I've seen you've been in the fast food industry and the franchising industry for a lot of years with Arby's and a number of other very fine companies. Uh, why don't you just start by giving us, you know, kind of where you've been. If you've been uh, in Tropical Smoothie for 20 years, is it? No, 10 years. In February will be 10 years for Tropical Smoothie, okay. so about nine and a half years. Were they, were they around before you got there? Or did, you, did you buy them or how yeah. did that whole thing get started? No, I started, uh, I started as their VP of Ops back in 2000, beginning of 2008. So they had been around for about 10 years. They had about 200 locations when I came on board in 2008 as their VP of ops. Um, right. Yep. Now you've got 600, right? Yes, sir. Uh, I think 605 as of today. That's what I thought. Uh, that's, that's phenomenal growth. And I, I read somewhere 58% since you took over? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, that, you know, that certainly qualifies for a league of extraordinary CEOs uh, <laughs> interview. I, I can tell you that. So uh, we're really pleased to have you. So you maybe you should start out, Mike. So you got into this. So you had a lot of experience in the industry, if you will, came in as VP, uh, EVP of uh, operations. And uh, typically operations guys don't like become CEOs. They just, they just right. don't. And so you must have saw something in this franchise where you could add value that other people didn't see. Then, of course, you had to go get the flipping money. Right, right. Tell us about that. So, yeah, it, 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 Tropical Smoothie was this kind of little gem that was just really uh, fragmented. It was a great brand. The concept, the theory behind the concept, the energy behind the concept was great. It just didn't have everything it needed. So, you know, it didn't have all the parts and pieces. It had a lot of them, but it didn't have the key ones. And one of the big ones was the unit level economics for the franchisees. You know, profitability was not very strong in 2008 for Tropical Smoothie franchisees. So, you know, what I did was, you know, I, I, I put a lot of effort around reducing costs for franchisees and growing revenue. So, you know, this double effect of, you know, sometimes you'll say, well, you know, we got we'll, we'll we'll save money, we'll we'll cut food costs, we'll figure out ways of of uh, reducing labor, but you can only do that so much, right? You can't save your way to prosperity. So we had to put systems and tools in place and change the mindset of the franchisees of you got to get out and grow your business. This isn't going to happen with you standing behind the counter. Um, and I think that's probably why it was such a good match, right? Tropical Smoothie and Mike Rotundo, because that's how I, I've always been. Whether I was a, a manager at Wendy's or a district manager at Honey Baked Ham, I was always kind of the street fighter marketing guy. So I come from ops, but I'm always interested in growing the business. 
So, you know, that was something that really was a great match for the brand. Got the franchisees excited about lower cost of goods and then got them excited and, and um, you know, involved in growing their business. And when I say street fighter marketing, I mean, I mean, literally, you know, me in a banana suit um, at the street with a sign. I mean, you know, we, we would go to markets and put me in a dunk tank, put me in a banana suit, whatever, whatever it took to bring people into the cafes, we did it. Um, and so I, I just always led from that kind of a perspective so that franchisees would say, well, gosh, if the VP of ops is doing it or the C, then when I got promoted to a COO or CEO, it was kind of like, you know, you know, how could I not do it if he'll do it? And same thing with my employees, you know, our, our team went from, you know, people that were just kind of in the office and providing support from a distance to really engaging with franchisees and getting out in the field and working with them. So I think that's, that's really where everything started going in the right direction was this match with what the brand needed and what my strengths and skills were. I think that's where things really started to, to gel. Well, it's uh, certainly true that people from below will not do what the top does not. Right. You, know, you can preach all day long, and uh, uh, it's your actions that really, you know, tell people where you're really at. But, but it couldn't have been. I want to come back in a minute to how how you saw something no one else did before you, because it sounds simple, but it it, it, it couldn't have been. Uh, but I but I want to uh, come back to the uh, part of motivating the franchisees. Okay, so you, you're the new kid in the block. You go, hey guys, rah rah, siskumba. Here's what we got to do, and they're probably going, yeah, right. I've heard this before. It, it couldn't have been an easy sell to get them to buy into your vision and be inspired by it. How did you do that? So one of the first things I did was um, it, it, we had our our conference in 2008. It was the first conference I had ever been at with Tropical Smoothie, and we had very poor attendance, um, and it was in Florida. Right. Like, you know, at that point in time, I think 70 percent of our cafes were in Florida, probably 80 percent in the southeast. We couldn't even get people to come to a conference in Florida. Um, they, they didn't have the money. They couldn't afford it. And they, they didn't want to come to a conference. Yeah. So after that conference, I went to the, the owner at the time because I was just VP of ops. And I said, we should cancel the conference for next year, which was going to be in Phoenix. I said, if we can't get people in Florida to come to Florida, we're clearly not going to get anybody out in Phoenix. Yep. So we canceled the meeting. And um, I did, uh, in the spring of that following year, I did a road show. I literally wrapped the bus in Tropical Smoothie uh, logos and everything. We called it Mission Possible and put myself and five other people from the support center on a bus. And we went on the road for six weeks and we did road show meetings with franchisees. We did 13 meetings around the country and basically said, you need this information. We need to talk about how to grow your business. Since you won't come to us, we'll come to you. Um, and just I, I there's three principles that I really hold true to. We do at the support center. And I think this this really shows a couple of them. But there's three things that I believe you have to do to be a great franchisor. And I think if you do these things, your franchisees will trust you and they will listen to you. The first one is communication. You have to communicate deeply and strongly to your franchisees on a regular basis. And not just one-way communication. It's got to be two-way communication, right? You have to give them the opportunity to communicate to you as well. But you got to communicate. And we weren't doing that. Right, you have a conference where only a few people show up. You're not communicating to the system. You have to help franchisees drive their economic engine. Right, you got to help them increase sales and increase profits. Well, telling franchisees to come to a conference at the time when they were hardly making any money just is not helping them drive their economic engine. The people that needed to be there the most couldn't afford to come. Hmm. And then the last thing is you have to show franchisees that you care. So if you communicate, if you help them drive their economic engine, you show them you care, you will build trust with them, and you'll be able to navigate these waters and bring change to a system that they embrace. Um, 
you know, uh, to be an example, it, when we rolled out the Island Green Smoothie, the smoothie made with spinach and kale, we oh, had oh, franchisees, oh, right? I had franchisees saying, Mike, you're crazy. I'm not, I'm not going to bring in the spinach and kale. Well, as the ones did bring it in and we started promoting it and they saw, oh my gosh, this thing is selling like crazy. Franchisees tell me all the time, they, Mike, I thought you were crazy when you said that. And now it's that that smoothie represents, I think, around 8% of our total sales, one smoothie. Holy so you do a few of those things. Yeah, we, we've stubbed our toe a few times. Not everything works, but you make enough of those deposits. Then a couple of years later, when I tell franchisees, we have a new smoothie and you're going to roast bananas and we're going to make a smoothie with roasted bananas. The franchisees just go, okay, and they start roasting bananas, right? Because sure. we've we've been able to build their trust over time. But that was interesting. Okay. The roadshow, the roadshow was our first step in that direction. Mm-hmm. Well, you're building leadership credibility where it probably wasn't as strong as it needed to be before. Correct. Now, let me ask you that just a slight tributary here. How the hell did you come up with a spinach and kale smoothie? <laughs> where'd that, where'd well, that? Man, we we kept saying we wanted to do a green smoothie. And I'm telling you, Steve, I, I if it was green, I put it in the blender. Okay. I mean, I was doing everything green. We were trying to make smoothies with it. And we just thought it was this healthier trend, you know, yeah. spinach yeah. and kale and how can but but we had to make it taste good. That right. was our thing. That's what took so long, and that's why it's so successful. Because it's a smoothie that's got spinach and kale in it, but it also has pineapple, bang, pineapple, mango, and banana. So it tastes really good. Kids love it, right? So, um, but it did not, it took a long time to, to create that smoothie because, you know, it, it, it had to taste good. And we had plenty that had a lot of nutritional value, but they didn't taste good. So... But, you know, uh, among other things, it's a huge leap of faith, irrespective of how much money you put into that, I'll call it a development, uh, and sure. you launch it, and it's like, how, you know, that, that's a huge leap of faith uh, the, that the thing would work and be successful and the franchisees would embrace it. I mean, that was risky. Yeah, we've done, we've done many of those, right? And, um, you know, we've, We've had a couple that, you know, haven't gone as well, but we've had multiple situations like that. And, and you know, we do do some testing, you know, but still at a small level. So it is it is still a risk. But, you know, we are our mission is to inspire a healthier lifestyle by serving amazing food and smoothies with a bit of tropical fun. And I just shortened it to our our mission is to inspire a healthier lifestyle. So we felt like that smoothie was in line with that mission. So that's what gave us such confidence around it, right? And we knew it was healthy and it tasted great, you know? So it was, you know, you, you kind of check the box on it's healthy. So people are going to, you know, people want healthier. And then when they get it and they taste it, you know, so we had, we had good confidence there. But yeah, it was definitely a risk. Well, you can't hit a home run if you don't uh, take a swing at bat, huh? That's right. That's right. You can't win the lottery if you don't play, right? <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. So let's come back a little bit uh, to, so your VP of operations, you, you seeing potential in, in this that others don't see or others haven't, you know, exploited. There'd be a better word for it. I don't mean exploit. Haven't uh, taken advantage of. Uh, and I, 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 do you own the company now, Mike? Or are you a major shareholder? What? No, no, I, I am a shareholder, but um, I, I'm CEO. We're owned by a private equity firm in Atlanta. Uh, right. Buckhead Investment Partners is our. Uh, they own the majority share. Okay, were they uh, you know, were they in the game when you when you took over when you got there? Or were, yeah, were there uh, other no, private? no, they were not. They they came in um, about a couple of years after I started, and they provided some uh, they provided some financing to the owner to to do some initiatives with Tropical Smoothie. And as they got to really understand the brand, then it was in 2012, that's when they made the, the investment. And so I was the COO at the time. In 2012, they made the major investment in Tropical Smoothie and then moved me into the CEO role at that time. Okay. So it'd be fair to say, would it be fair to say in 2008, this uh, PE 
uh, company would not have made that investment based on uh, no. vision. And okay, so they saw something in you and in your vision. Yes. Okay. Yes. They, they, how'd you convince the, them of that? that? Yes. Yes. So how'd you convince them of that? Oh, so it was it was really to to look and see where we were going, right? Because you know the 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 brand had tremendous upside. So you had if you look at the followers of the brand, the brand has incredible fan loyalty. I mean, we have some of the most loyal fans, and the frequency. Where remember, we're we're sixty percent of our sales are beverage, are, are smoothies, and forty percent is food. Mm-hmm. So we do have a good, you know. 42% of our business occurs during lunch. So it's wow. a lunch destination, but we also sell these great smoothies. So you've got this incredible frequency, you know, it's, it's a, uh, so the, it's almost like kind of this Starbucks type frequency where you have people coming in this place sometimes three, four, five times a week. Wow. So what they saw, what they saw was a brand was solid. Like it, it definitely had legs, but we had some things we had to figure out. We had to figure development out, right? We had to really be able to scale this. Well, you know, we had taken time to look at how we were growing, how we would do it differently. Um, So there was the scalability of it. But there was also this concept of, you know, BIP, if you guys get control of this, there are some things, some resources that we could put into Tropical Smoothie, and here's how we would grow. So we basically laid it out and, you know, Everybody was in agreement, and you know the investors, uh, the the equity firm, everybody. When they saw the vision of how we were going to grow this, you know they they just they all they they jumped all over it. Well, the, you know these as you know these guys are tough guys. I mean they don't just buy into any old cushy, warm, squishy feeling right. kind of thing. They had to really run you over the coals just to test your assumptions. Oh sure, and it was you did a lot. With, without very much. I mean, don't get me wrong. They, they allowed us to keep money in the business and they allowed us, you know, they weren't looking for big returns right away. We had, we had great ability to reinvest in the brand, but, you know, we were, we, we were small and everybody, you know, I always said at, at, at Tropical Smoothie, we were very scrappy. You know, we, you know, it, it, I was the CEO, but I was still, you know, doing operations and, and my, Chief development officer was doing sales and real estate and construction. So, you know, we were we were very very lean back in 2012 and 2013. Well, uh, and I've always said that every, uh, to your point of scrappy, every company should act scrappy. Every company should act in some ways like a startup because right. uh, cash is everything. Uh, you know, I, I've worked for big and I've worked for small companies and. You know, the huge mega corporations, uh, it's like they're playing Monopoly, for Christ's sake. It's not like they're playing with real money. You get down right, to a smaller heard, uh, middle market company, it's, it's all about the cash. I heard somebody, God, I wish I could remember who said this, but it was, uh, think tall, act small. Yep. Right? <laughs> so, you know, uh, you can't ever forget that. Oh, that's right. Uh, and the private equity guys, uh, you you hit on a key point, Mike, because uh, and I've had a lot of private equity guys try to come in and buy my company, and I and I we're, we're not for sale, but I've turned them all down for a number of reasons. Not not only is which you know if you're not going to leave cash in the business business for future growth, you got the wrong partner. Right, right, and they're Jeez. and they're yeah, and we've been very very lucky in that respect. I mean, they this is not that was the other thing was. You know, when when they made the purchase, a lot of franchisees were freaking out because they were anticipating, oh, they're gonna they're gonna make the investment in tropical smoothie, they're buy tropical smoothie, and like three years, they're they're just gonna they're gonna slash, and then they're just gonna flip it to some other private equity firm. And they do. I just I, I just was not getting that message from them, right? I was not getting that feeling. You know, my my radar was was tuned to that, right? Like, is this dangerous? But it just just never really felt like that. And, you know, here we are five and five, five years, later. years later. I mean, August is five years later. And, you know, they're continuing to be very bullish on the brand and uh, allowing us to invest in leadership positions that we need now. So, you know, this is not this this uh, I don't think ever was this concept of 
get it, you know, sell a bunch of franchise agreements and then flip it to somebody. Um, so, so it's, it's that, I think that has, has gone very well. That's key for my readers is, uh, and I've made this point before is if you're going to get in bed with a PE company, better make sure it's one that's got long-term growth in mind. Now, if you, if you want to flip it, be done in three years and cash out, that's one thing. But, uh, if you want to grow the business, you, you can't do it in three years. You just can't do yeah. it. No way. No way. I mean, you're, it, but it, you can't do it. Yeah, in a lot of ways, you're, a lot of times you're just putting in foundational things, right? You're preparing it for the future, you know, all right. those things. Right. Um, and and then you're like we are right now. I mean, you know, we're just selling, you know, what are we awarding? a hundred Between 150 and 200 franchise agreements a year right now. Wow. We'll open 105 cafes this year, 120 next year. I mean, the cool. pipeline is just. Well, and you know what's great, Steve? This is this is a metric that I look at. Like when I think about a business, like you know, how, how do businesses evaluate? What's a what's a barometer that they use on their business that's outside of EBITDA? Um, and one of the things that that I look at is how much of our business is coming from existing franchisees. Yep. So, fifty five percent of the franchise agreements that we award are with existing franchisees. So. They've opened a cafe. They've seen behind the curtain, right? They they know everything there is to know about operating a tropical smoothie, and they're saying, "Yeah, I want more of this," right? So I think, yeah, when you think about that, I, I think about other franchise systems, and I go, "How many of your existing franchisees are saying, yes, I want more of this?" Yep, yep. And and not just for a year. This is over time. More and more franchisees saying they want to do more with Tropical Smoothie. So, um, you know, when I see our growth and, you know, you have concepts that might award 150 franchise agreements, is that because they've awarded all these big multi-unit franchise agreements? You know, so they signed somebody with 50 and somebody else with 25. I mean, we only, we've, I think our biggest we've ever signed is a 20 pack and that's one. Most others are onesie, twosie, threesies, you know, but we don't have these big, massive developers that say they're going to build, you know, 100 locations in the next five years. This is all still a lot of mom and pops and small business guys um, that are growing this brand. And show satisfaction with everything. Right. Right. I mean, it seems like I'm not in the franchise business. I'm a manufacturer, but seems like uh, it'd be easy to add franchisees, but if you take a look at how many of them are with you five years later and how many of them have reinvested with you five years later, that'd be more important than how many you can add in a year. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you can, I mean, you look at, I mean, you know, you, you can see other franchise brands that exploded, right? They grew and grew and grew, and now they're, now they've, they've just gone backwards and, and, you know, all the, all the carnage along the way, right? <laughs> from from that growth and then down to nothing now. So we're really trying to, you know, we we are we are trying to say stay so true to protecting our franchisees. We turn down, uh, I, I, I we probably turn down more locations than we approve. Really? Because we're just not going to let somebody go in and erode existing business. Yeah. Yeah. That turning down, Mike, uh, is that a combination of uh, this is not a good location based on geography, population, consumer taste, whatever um, it is you use, or, or the people themselves in terms of you don't have enough net worth, you don't have enough business experience. How does that play itself out? So, so, so I would say the location is probably number one, right? So that that's just it's just not the right spot for us to be. You know, if it's an emerging market, we've got to be in the right spot at the right time. If it's a built out market, we've got to go into a spot that isn't going to affect other franchisees. And on the franchisee side, we have turned down people that had the finances. I mean, they were fully qualified financially to be a franchisee. It just it, it didn't feel right. They, there's a process that you have to go through to be a franchisee. And one of the things that we have learned is that if they're not going to follow the process before they sign a franchise agreement, yeah. you're, good luck with them following process no after kidding. they've signed the franchise agreement. So our 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 franchise uh, our franchise development guys, you know, if they if they tell somebody, yep, well, the first step is to fill out the application, and then they follow up with the person, and the person says, well, I really want to talk about this location. 
and we say, well, we got to get an application filled out. Yeah. If they ask them two or three times and the, the potential franchisee keeps asking questions and never fills out an application, our they're team will there. dead lead them. They're, they're, they're done. They're, they're because they're, they're saying, because I, I tell, I tell my sales guys, right? You date these people. I have to marry them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? So don't, that's a don't good analogy to, for any sales guy. That's right. Don't don't bring anybody to the altar that uh, <laughs> you know you wouldn't want to wake up to and look at every morning. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to steal that one. I use that again. I'll, yeah. I'll give you credit though. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Let's uh, just uh, loop a little bit through uh, to your. Stark raving fans, where do they show up other than, you know, at your stores, of course, they show up on social media? They do. They're very big in social media. I mean, we launched, we launched an app um, uh, about last July. We have our Tropical Smoothie app, right? And we launched it, and I think we have close to a million downloads of that app a year Jesus later. Christ. I mean, it's Amazing. like 50,000. Yeah, I think uh, currently... 12% of our transactions are flowing through that app. So whether they're ordering and paying ahead or they're just using it for their loyalty points. I mean, again, for a brand our size to be getting numbers like that, I mean, that's like that's like Dunkin' Donut numbers. You know, I mean, yeah. Starbucks is at like 20%. Panera is probably 15 to 20%. But, yeah. you know, a little tropical smoothie and uh, they, we launched that app, and our fans just went crazy for it. Um, but they're in social media. When we do a grand opening, you know, we'll do grand openings. I was at I was at our 600th cafe opening in Missouri, and I went there. And the night before, people were lined up around the building because we usually give out like 50. We'll give out 50 or 100 cards for smoothies for a year, so they get free smoothies for a year. People will camp out the night before. Um, I actually went to the opening and saw all these people outside, and it was really hot. So I went over to the to the Walgreens and bought about eight cases of bottled water <laughs> and brought it over to them because I, I didn't want anybody getting hurt. And then I and then I actually ordered pizza for them all too. I, I had pizza show up at about eleven o'clock at night. Right, but, um, Springsteen probably doesn't get those kind of people outside in the line. <laughs> so they they're just. They're, you know, they, they love us. They love the brand. They love what the brand stands for. Um, and, you know, we just see more and more. And the other thing too, Steve, it's not just the Southeast. Some of our best cafes, I mean, our fastest growing market right now is Michigan. Michigan. I mean, they, they are killing it up there. I think we've got, I think we have 65 locations open now. There'll be 75 probably within the next six months. Oh um, they are, and they're doing, they're, they're, they just come out of the gate strong up there. And uh, so it is not just a warm climate uh, brand. Yeah. Yeah. This brand plays, we're in Fargo, North Dakota. You know, I mean. Don't get much colder than that. Right, right. I'll stick with the social media for a minute, uh, Mike, if you, yeah. if you don't mind, because particularly when I'm talking to uh, manufacturers that say, I don't need no stinking social media, it's a huge part, I think, uh, an advantage for any business. And by the way, uh, your uh, website is very smartphone enabled. I was on it with my iPhone this morning. It was very easy to navigate, and it's good yeah. that it can optimize for that. A lot of manufacturers especially they throw out a website they go yeah okay fine here's who we are we're great you should buy our stuff and all that crap and that's about as far as they do <clears throat> one of the things that i that i'm telling ceos that they should uh engage in is uh the so-called cause marketing and and i see that you've done that with uh is it camp hope oh camp sunshine camp sunshine yes oh, tell us about that. yeah yeah that we we've, we've had a matter of fact Part of the reason why I'm in D.C. is uh, we're getting an award tonight uh, through the International Franchise Association, and they have a program called Franchising Gives Back. Several years ago, the International Franchise Association got together and said, you know what? We do a franchisees and franchisors do a lot in their communities. And I don't think people really realize that. You know, we're kind of we're not getting credit for all this stuff we do. So they put this Franchising Gives Back together to recognize 
franchisors that are doing amazing things. So we're getting this award last night or tonight. We're getting an award for the Enduring Spirit Award because we've been with Camp Sunshine now for 10 years. We've raised over $5 million for that camp. Um, and That's amazing. It, it, yeah. Our, our cafes, I mean, I would say the average cafe every year raises somewhere between 1500 to $2,000. Wow. for Camp Sunshine. Wow. And it's, it's a, you know, we, we started this relationship years ago and I would say that you're absolutely right. You know, this whole kind of, you know, the idea of philanthropy and, and standing, being a part of something bigger than yourselves. Yep. I'll tell you one thing, if you have millennials on your team, oh, you yeah. have to do stuff like this Oh yeah, because they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And Camp Sunshine is this amazing camp up in Maine, we partnered with them because of, you know, three, three reasons. You know, when you pick a partner, you really got to determine why, why would you want to help this organization? Yeah. Because there's so many to choose from, right? Well, the first thing was, this is a camp for kids with life-threatening illnesses, but also their family attends. So parents and siblings go with them to this camp. So there's counseling sessions for parents. There's counseling sessions for siblings of the sick children. So we saw that as a real something we really wanted to, to get behind this whole concept of the whole family unit goes to this camp. The second piece is when you look at their ratings, right? So they have one of the highest ratings when it comes to nonprofits in terms of how much of the funds that get donated goes into the camp versus salaries, right? So, you know, they, you know, majority is volunteers at Camp Sunshine. There's only a handful of people that are on salary. And then the last thing was the people that the people that they were, right? I mean, they're they're just amazing. I mean, the founder Anna Gould is coming to this dinner tonight to for us to, to get this award. And uh, and the IFA actually makes a donation to Camp Sunshine for us winning this award. But but just to just to give you an example of I think sometimes that, that people miss you know, forget about all the all the the great that you do for these families. And I mean, every time I go to camp, you know, I have these parents come up to me and tell me, you know, how amazing camp is. And if it wasn't for Tropical Smoothie, they wouldn't be able to do this. Mm -hmm. But I was at an event, and I was with a family from Camp Sunshine. Paige, this this uh, Jody was the mom, and her and her husband, and Paige and her daughter, and we're in New York, and uh, Paige was uh, co was combating cancer. And so we're going around and, and she's like 13 now. This is like five years ago. And we're over like by the Today Show and these photographers come out and want to take a picture with us. And we all have our smoothies in our hand, you know, and, and we're sitting down in front. And when right before the photographer takes the picture, Joe, the mom and the girls are like at that point in time, Paige was eight. I think her sister was maybe 10. So the mom goes right before the guy takes the picture. The mom goes, girls, logo forward. And the girls all look at their cup and make sure the tropical smoothie logo is facing forward. Right. And I, I was, I, it just blew me away because that was like the last thing on my mind. Right? Of course. <laughs> but, of course. But here's somebody but, from camp that really understands the partnership and, right. and how, you know, her daughter and her family would not have what they have if it wasn't for a place like Camp Sunshine and Tropical sure, Smoothie. Sure. You know, and that's what she's thinking about. Well, right. So congratulations on your on your award tonight. Yeah, it's exciting. Very exciting. But but before I leave this subject for all the hard nosed CEOs out there who say, uh, you know, cause marketing is squishy and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of studies done, it, as I'm sure you know, Mike, that uh, prove and validate that uh, particularly millennials are willing to pay more. Given two brands side by side, they're willing to pay more for the one that's engaged in the kinds of things that you are than the one that's not. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's great to hear. And, oh, yeah. and I, I believe that I believe that a hundred percent. There's no question about it. I'll send it. I'll, I have it somewhere. I'll send it. I'll send you the studies just uh, uh, for uh, interest sake, but uh, been a lot of studies on that because, okay, we all know uh, millennials uh, think differently than everybody else on the planet. And I'm not a millennial. I'm, you know, I'm a baby boomer and, uh, and I've told CEOs, Time and time again, you know, don't just dismiss the millennials as people you don't understand and don't care and, and can't get engaged. You have to be able to uh, uh, address them on their own terms. And yes. what are their own terms? 
I want to come to work when I want to come to work. Family comes first. Sustainability is important in cause marketing and uh, and supporting charitable organizations is really those four things. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I will tell you when it comes to recruiting, right, and, and you get these employees on board and you start telling them and they start seeing the stuff we do for Camp Sunshine, I mean, they're, they're, they're engaged. They right? recruit they love for you. It. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't, you, you, know, you know this better than I do, Mike, you can't convince somebody on the outside of the worthiness of coming to work for you, but someone on the inside can do it better than you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Mike, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, I'm hoping I covered all the high points. Uh, are there any, is there anything that I missed, Mike, that we should have gotten into or that you wanted to get into? I would, there's really really just, just two things that I would share. One of the things, you know, I was thinking about, you know, what if, when, when you think about what's contributed, like what, what, what really, you know, what's been kind of the hallmark to just what I've done, but also what Tropical Smoothie has been able to do. And, and I, 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 the way I break it down is a lot of times people will say that Mike's never satisfied. Like, you know, no matter how good the brand's doing, there's this little bit of a negative connotation that, you know, he's never satisfied. You know, we're up double digits and he wants more. You know, we, we awarded 100 franchise agreements. He wants 200. Um, all that. Right. So the way I explain it to people, I, I think this helps them is there's a difference. It's not that I'm not satisfied. I'm very excited. I'm very happy for what the brand has done. The difference is I don't ever want to settle for anything less than what I think is possible for myself or for the brand. This brand deserves a great CEO. And I aspire, I'm not there yet, but I want to be a great CEO, right? So I can't ever settle, right? I, I, I can be satisfied, I can be happy, but I'm never going to settle for anything less than what I think is possible for myself or for the brand. And, and it can be frustrating and not everybody can work with that. Some people can't, can't handle that type of an environment, but that's the kind of environment we have is at, at Tropical Smoothie. And, and that's how I've thought about things. And the, the, last thing, the last thing I was just going to say is that I think sometimes I talk a lot about at the support center with employees in terms of you know, influence versus leadership. And so I think about you know, kind of my to, – to other CEOs or other business leaders or whatever, don't ever think that what you do can't make a difference. Like you're too small. Well, my brand, nobody's going to care. I can't influence. I can't do that. I disagree. I, I look at things that Tropical Smoothie has done, and I know that we influenced actions of other brands through the things that we've done. So, oh, sure. And, you know, so, so I think sometimes people, they don't, they don't shoot for the stars. You know, they don't ever really push hard because they kind of look at it and go, well, what difference is it really going to make? Well, I'm telling you it can make a very big difference. And, you know, I remember the, the, the first time when, when we said we were going to raise a million dollars for Camp Sunshine and everybody thought I was crazy. And I just said, guys, here, here's how the numbers work. Let me walk you through the numbers. And then all of a sudden, everybody's like, well, I guess it isn't that crazy, mm-hmm. you know? So, so anyway, that's, those are the things that I think really, really drive, um, drive me and have really driven the, the brand over the past few years is, you know, I tell people I'm not interested with what's realistic. What I want to know is what's possible. Yep. Yep. Well, I would say a couple of things uh, to your last point. All boats rise in a rising tide. And uh, sure. when, you're, when you're dragging the industry into a place they didn't want to be, but they ought to be, they all start getting a little sharper and then everybody benefits from that. Yes, sir. Yes, the sir. The other thing I would say is I would disagree that you're not a great CEO. Uh, Mike, I think <laughs> you've done a fabulous job. And uh, well, I, I have to be honest with you, I wouldn't have interviewed you if I didn't think you were a CEO, <laughs> didn't belong in the League of Extraordinary CEOs Club. So I'm uh, <laughs> thrilled we had a chance to talk today. All right. Well, Steve, if there's ever anything else you need from me, please just let me know. I appreciate you being flexible with the, the interview and stuff. There's so much going on. And, um, uh, you know, and again, anything you need. Just- You've been listening to Transform, Ignite, Disrupt. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit stephenlblue.com.